Hi, I'm Jamie. And I'm Stacey. And this is the Body Smart Podcast. And today we have got our guest, Nicole, Nicole Keeling. She is a registered dietitian with an extensive experience in hospital-based practice and also working with clients one-to-one on things like weight loss and diabetes. But Nicole has a very special interest in women's health-related issues. So we're really thrilled to have you here today on the podcast. Thank you. Um, And we're going to be covering all things gut health today because Mm -hmm. it's something we get asked about a lot. And we'd love you to cut the BS on some of the things that are out there. Um, And also how the food industry makes life a bit harder to make the smart choices that people might want to be making around their nutrition. So let's get stuck in with the gut health thing, because it's definitely a common question that we get asked. It's a big buzzword on social media at the moment. Is this justified? Gut health. Yeah, like should we, yeah, should we be as like hyped up about it? Or is it just another trend that the media are jumping on? I think, I mean, for once, it's actually not a trend. And it's super, super important, because if your gut is healthy, that can influence your mood, um, your metabolism, nutrient absorption, your, you know, your immune system. I mean, majority of your immune system is actually found in the gut. And also actually 90% of your serotonin, which is your happy hormone, is um, also made and found in the gut. So gut health can really influence your whole life. Um, So yeah, I think a lot of things in on social media are just the fad or, you know, but gut health is the one thing that we really need to focus on and work on improving. And the good news is, is that you can do this with food, you can completely change your gut microbiome through changing your dietary eating patterns. Mm-hmm. So yeah. What are, what are some things that people are typically doing that makes them have bad gut health? I think one of the main things that people are doing is not getting enough diversity in their diet. So people often tend to eat similar things every single day, which is a huge like red flag. Um, we need to try eat. There's, there's this basic guideline out there of 30 plants per week, 30 different plants per week. And um, I really try with my patients to instill that in them because different gut bacteria thrive on different compounds in, or in these foods. So for instance, plants are They contain a wide range of things called um, polyphenols and um, different gut bacteria like different polyphenols. So like bacteria one will like the compounds in broccoli, but bacteria two will like the compounds in carrots. And to keep your whole gut happy, you need to include all of these in your diet. So I think the biggest, to answer your question, the biggest thing is that people aren't eating enough different foods. You know, Mm. we're so used to just everyday meal prepping the same thing for lunch and dinner. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like you're not keeping your whole gut microbiome happy. I think that's really common. We often say to people when they are trying to start tracking their food, for example, don't worry, it'll be quite easy because you probably don't eat that much different food (laughs) from week to week. And it's true, people end up with their favorite list on MyFitnessPal. Oh, it's Weetabix again for breakfast. Oh, a banana again for a snack. Um, And it does sound quite intimidating actually like the idea of 30 different plants Mm. because like people are trying to aim for five a day yeah and I don't know what the stats are but like the actual number of people that eat five a day even not very high yeah no it's not high at all and also people shouldn't be limited to think that plants equals fruits and vegetables because when we say 30 different plants per week it's nuts seeds whole grains oats all all of that which Mm -hmm. you know don't just think it's I can only have because 30 fruits and vegetables is quite a difficult thing yeah. to, to You'd get have to, to be a very, very exotic menu. You would. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And like a lot of people think, oh, but that's going to go off in the fridge or whatever. But like nuts and seeds and all of that, you can keep, you know. Right. And little little changes, for instance, buying frozen vegetables, it's mm-hmm. fine. Like avoid the canned ones um, because they contain less fiber than the frozen ones. Oh, right. How yeah. come? It's just through processing of you know, how they process foods and things that are added and things like that. But um, yeah, so to prevent food from going off and you're worried about that, you can buy frozen veg. It's mm-hmm. a lo- I think a lot of people think it's less healthy mm-hmm. and it's not. Yeah. I've heard some people say like frozen uh, fruit and veg can be healthier sometimes because it's yeah. frozen at the time that it, they get it. And yeah. And it can possibly keep more nutrients and minerals. Yeah, to be honest, I'm, I'm not 100% sure yeah. about that. Yeah. But I mean, I, I don't understand why it's seen it as less healthy than... Yeah, I guess because it's, it's, it's in the freezer next to the fish and chips. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's just mungled together with all those things. Yeah, you like kind of assume. Or the, what could be is a lot of frozen stuff, they um, like... 
So for instance, a lot of my patients say, oh, for dinner I had um, chicken breast. I don't understand. It's frozen chicken breast. I don't understand why that's not healthy. And then you ask them about how, how you know, it looks and stuff and you find out that, oh, it's a crumbed chicken breast. Mm. And, you know, so it could be that they're adding things to the veggie. Milk have a very beige diet. Yeah, like everyone's very beige. There's a lack of color. In, yeah. in almost every meal, um, and that is that's where you're getting that like a you know nutrients, uh, minerals, mm-hmm. fiber, um, and a lot of people will even just say, I don't like vegetables. Or I don't like eating plants. Um, like that's a very common yeah. thing that people say. Like, have you got any advice for people who are trying to just incorporate more color into their diet? Well, you you've got to do your own research and find what and work with dietitians and nutritionists and find what recipes you can use to make these taste good. I mean, a lot of my patients, um, like their moms and they're struggling with their kids to get them to eat fruits and veggies. So I would say like, instead of buying a store-bought cheese sauce or whatever to put over pasta, roast and blend as many vegetables as possible and make that your pasta sauce. The kids won't even notice the difference. Mm -hmm. Or if you're making like, um, spaghetti bolognese, like great in carrots, zucchini, mushrooms, you know, as much as possible into that meal. Um, And to be honest, they won't notice the difference. Yeah, Yeah. that's one of the really big hacks, actually, I say to clients um, to add volume to their meals. Yeah, because if you take a spaghetti bolognese and you add a carrot and a zucchini and a whole packet of mushrooms, Mm -hmm. it tastes better. And you get like this much food instead of this much food. But the calorie increase is like, 30 calories yeah Um, and you feel like oh wow I've had a really nice big portion I'm really satisfied Mm -hmm. and you've done your health a favor at the same time yeah exactly and you're adding so much fiber to your diet I mean the the recommended like daily intake for fiber should be between about 25 to 38 grams a day Mm -hmm. and currently people are eating less than 15 grams a day Mm -hmm. yeah Um, so surprising yeah yeah my mum actually um had diverticulitis um, a couple of years ago and yeah. one of the things that she was asked to track was her fiber intake mm-hmm. and it like blew her mind how little fiber she thought she ate pretty well yeah and now she's like I have my apple every single morning <laughs> and you know she's got yeah. her things now that she knows are high in fiber but I think sometimes it takes a health scare or a disease or a, something going wrong for people to actually take stock of like oh I thought I was eating pretty healthily but mm-hmm. maybe I'm not yeah, no, exactly. Um, and l- tracking your fiber and things like that. You don't need to do it for a lifetime, but doing it for one to two weeks, you can kind of get an idea how much am I really eating, which which helps a lot. So, yeah. yeah, and to learn like what are those little swaps you can make or what things can I add into my diet to help? Yeah, that's uh, the one thing with like gut health and stuff. You shouldn't think of what you should be taking away, but rather what can you add in because the gut likes diversity mm-hmm. so much. I mean, if we eat a diverse diet... Um, you're keeping the gut bacteria happy, you're diversifying it, you're increasing the amount of probiotics in your gut. So yeah, it's really... It's yeah, there was like, there's like a, a, and again, whether I'm right here, please fact check me, but you know, like some of the best things that you can do for kids in terms of their gut health is like, let them roll around in the mud, you know, yeah. let them have a, if you have a dog, typically you see better gut bacteria because they're bringing in, you know, like just more... Oh yeah, my mum's dog literally licks my child in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah but it's it's yeah. it's it's good for them in a, in a lot of ways because it helps them build up more of that like healthy bacteria and yeah. how to fight some of that of this stuff off yeah, yeah yeah and i mean like your gut needs bacteria it's it's good bacteria to help you mm-hmm. thrive and the more diverse ones you have the more they colonize and you know grow and flourish and all of that so yeah because it's, Cause, it's almost like we've gone down this like hyper cleanse of everything isn't it like yeah. you know like and it's not a bad thing like always wash your hands always do this mm. everything's going to be like you know but then we sometimes are robbing our gut of that bacteria of that like if everything's just so clean all the time yeah absolutely the second that you do get in one of those situations where maybe you're getting a little bit of this bacteria your body doesn't know how to handle it or your gut doesn't yeah no yeah. definitely i've i've also heard quite often like when you have a child get a pet or have a dog or something because it helps so much with the gut microbiome at yeah. the end of the day so you, that like uh getting more variety basically in your mm-hmm. diet is it something that can help but i guess like what are some of the because when people think of gut health they probably yeah. just think i have a bloated stomach or i have yeah. pains in my stomach like what are the t- typical symptoms that you'll see for people who are having gut health issues so bloating is a huge one and i mean a little bit of bloat is is normal like in the mm-hmm. evenings um but to feel bloated after eating 
breakfast every single day and just throughout the day just feeling like you're like five months pregnant after just having a small meal is not normal. We see a lot of um, diarrhea and constipation and just continual abdominal pain. Mm -hmm. And all of this um, indicates poor gut health, but also things like um, always getting sick, like a weakened immune system, because so much of the immune system is in the gut. That is an indication. Um, if you're experiencing like poor skin health, um, constant acne and things. I know with women, obviously, we've got to look at our hormones and things like that. But like constant poor skin is also linked to, mm. to gut health. Um, there's a lot of things, poor mental health, um, mm. that's major. Like um, because most of our serotonin is found in the gut. If our gut's not happy, our mind's not happy. So, yeah, I would say all of those symptoms are seen. Yeah. I've got to ask yeah. about poo. Yeah. Um, <laughs> How regular is regular? Like, what's the healthy recommended yeah. number of poos per day or week? Or, or like, because some people, I've got friends who are like, yeah, I only go like every three days and it's fine. Yeah. And in my head, I'm like, I don't know if that is fine. Is it fine? Yeah. I mean, if they're not feeling that, that seems a bit little to me. Um, I would say you should go at least once a day. Okay. Um, but I think every it's like gut health is so specific to each individual person. Um, th what did you say? Three times a, a uh, week? Like, yeah. Every three days. Every three, three, days, days. Yeah. three yeah. days. Yeah, that seems a bit irregular. And maybe they should check what they're eating and how much mm. fiber they're getting in their diet. Um, I don't think there's like a set point of what you should aim for because everyone is so different. Like some people have been going three times a day for as long as they can remember. And they're yeah. fine on that. They don't, mm. you know, they don't what's have issues. The, um, a lot of time on the what's, toilet. What's the chart, chart called? Like we've done a couple of Oh, the like, Bristol stool chart. The Bristol stool yeah. chart, yeah. yeah. Cause that, and that basically says about one to three times a day, but it also shows you like what a healthy stool should also look so like. Look like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because like I, I think a lot of people are probably not having healthy stools, but maybe just feel like that's normal to them, which is often a great indication of like a healthy yeah. stool is often a sign of a healthy body and a healthy gut as well yeah absolutely and like they're straining when they're going to the toilet it's you know and that 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 is a clear indication of constipation mm -hmm. and the need to fix their diet so yeah. yeah when i really started looking into like uh dietary fiber and fiber you know a couple of four or five years ago i was like huh there's more than one type of fiber yeah um which was like a little bit of a like i was like oh you can actually have too much of one type of fiber and not enough so yeah. there's soluble and insoluble yeah um what are the primary differences between the two so soluble fiber is um we need both in our mm -hmm. diet every day um but if like i've got patients suffering from severe diarrhea then we would advise for soluble fiber because what that does is it absorbs extra water in the intestines mm -hmm. and then that obviously helps like form the stool Whereas with constipation, you want to look for a mix of both insoluble and soluble, focusing yeah. on insoluble, because insoluble fiber will add bulk to the stool and just keep it moving along the gut. Mm -hmm. So it's it's different types of fiber for yeah. each. Um, yeah. Because I've seen that sometimes I've had clients who have had actually had good fiber scores. So I'm mm -hmm. like, hmm, they're getting mm -hmm. like fake grams of fiber a day. That's, that's not bad for like maybe like 1500 or 1800 calories. Yeah. Um, and then I've like looked at the type of fiber that they're getting. And they're like, hmm, they're getting 18 grams of fiber from a Quest bar. I'm like, huh. I'm like, that's like, let's look at, you know, removing the Quest bar to getting some blueberries, raspberries, yeah. different types of, you know, fruits and vegetables in there to bump up that fiber score, maybe some beans. And then all of a sudden, like instantly like saying that they're having better stools um, mm -hmm. just because they've, even though they're getting the same amount of fiber, they've just swapped the food mm, sources yeah, that they're getting it from. from. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And a lot of fiber can act as a um, prebiotic, which is basically what your gut bacteria love. They thrive off this. This is their like nourishment. And when those are fermented by the gut bacteria, they produce something called short chain fatty acids, which um, an example of this is butyrate. And butyrate is, it's so good for us. It helps um, strengthen the junctions between the, the cells in the in the gut wall to okay. prevent like unhealthy things from getting in and the good stuff from getting out. As long as that tight junction is kept like solid, it's really good for us. And that's what butyrate does. But it also it's amazing for preventing cravings. So um, yeah, like especially women when they're in their um, luteal phase of their cycle, they tend to get more cravings. And having things like resistant starches and prebiotics that produce these this. Um, short chain fatty acids can really help with the cravings and weight loss and all of that. That's really helpful so, information. So yeah. what kind of foods would that be? 
So resistant starches are um, often found in foods high in fiber, so your lentils and beans and all of that. And also um, what's great is if you, say now you cook and you cool your carbohydrates, like mm. if you cook oats, wait for it to cool. And even if you re reheat it up again, it forms more resistant starch than if you had to just eat the hot bowl of oats. Right. Which yeah. is quite cool. I, same thing with potatoes. Yeah. I found that like certain foods that like I, if I reheat them, like they just do not agree with my gut. Yeah. So like uh, broccoli is one that if I like reheat broccoli, yeah. just like no, like I will just, I will get like gut issues and gut pain. Yeah. Same with maybe like onions um, and just like some meals, like often I will just find when I reheat food. Mm -hmm. uh, it, yeah, it rice does that for me. Yeah. So resistant starches, although they are super helpful in that way, they also can cause bloating. Mm -hmm. So it might mean that you just need to incorporate it more slowly and work your way up. But at the end of the day, in certain people, that resistant starch is going to cause bloating. Mm -hmm. Well, that yeah. makes sense if you think about what you've explained is because it's fermenting to create those the fatty acids. Fatty acids. Yeah. And so the fermentation creates gas. Yes, exactly. So yeah. you've got to find the perfect amount. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you also got to look at what are you like struggling with? Uh -huh. um, like a lot of um, patients who come with um, irritable bowel syndrome or IBS, um, the like standard diet for them to mm. follow is a low FODMAP diet, which looks at like the different sugars and how they're fermented in the, in the colon and all of that. But a low FODMAP diet is also very low in fiber because you're cutting out a lot of things. It's quite restrictive. So that's really important. It's f to work with a dietitian and not just once of, oh, I'll follow a low FODMAP diet and be on my way. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to slowly incorporate those foods back into your diet and see really what triggers you. There might be things that you like, I, this just doesn't agree with me. I can't mm -hmm. eat it. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, uh, we say this like a lot and I still, people just want this like one size fits all approach. Like just tell me what I've got to do. Tell me what I've got to do. But it's, it's just not that case. Like no. learning the foods that work specifically with, with you and like your genetics and your body. It's like, it's a skill, isn't it? It's a skill in terms yeah. of like understanding, Hey, like what's the, the right match of food for like, cause like what I eat and what you eat could be, you know, the perfect match of that could be completely different. Yeah. And even though there's maybe some like general things that are good for a lot of most people like mm -hmm. um one of the guys that we work with Corey, he's had to just like stop eating apples he's oh like, yeah i can't eat apples yeah he just like yeah. if he eats an apple i can eat like half as yeah you know he yeah. just like stabbing pains in his stomach mm -hmm. but like you know, most people would say but an apple is healthy for you yeah. but for some people it's actually it's, it's not yeah. so yeah. it is really about just you know, going through this process and becoming self-aware and, mm -hmm. and developing Keeping those skills food diaries yeah and understanding yeah. like what foods are going to agree with you best because it's it, it really can be like life changing. Yeah. Like so life changing. No, exactly. And it also, once again, depends on your gut microbiome, which is not, mm. I mean, the gut microbiome is not just the bacteria in the gut, but it's also like the, um, the hormones and the proteins and the gases that they're producing and things like that. It's, it encompasses everything. Mm. Um, for instance, there was a study done by Washington University um, where they took, um, two twins one was really obese and one was quite slim and they um took um gut bacteria from each of their guts and they put it into mice that were sterile so these mice had no prior gut bacteria and the mice that the that was given the gut bacteria from the obese um twin actually became obese mm -hmm. and those that were given the gut bacteria from the lean twin stayed lean mm -hmm. and they were put on the exact same diet so it's not a one size approach all kind of thing and it just shows that your gut microbiome can really influence everything yeah yeah and so that can feel quite defeating though if you yeah. think well i am overweight so my gut microbiome is maybe one of the reasons mm -hmm. is that something that people can start to influence themselves yeah it's definitely related to food you can change your gut microbiome um, and there's certain things you can do. For example, like I said, the, the polyphenols and different plants um, can change your gut microbiome. Adding probiotics to your diet can, I mean, probiotics are the live actual bacteria that mm. you supplement that that's already in our guts, but you're just supplementing. Yeah. Um, it's obviously, you've got to be quite cautious with probiotics because a lot of things are labeled as probiotics and it's like what strains were used um, because probiotics will be listed as the genus so like lactobacillus mm -hmm. and then it's the species um and then the strain okay but a lot of products will say probiotics and they just have the genus they don't have the actual strain or they do have the strain but not all strains are probiotics 
So you've got to really... Because a lot of people will see like Actamel. Yeah, Yakult. See, yeah. Yakult, or they'll see these like supplements and they'll say like probiotic, health, good good bacteria or healthy for your gut. And yeah. people just like blindly go, well, my stomach hurts, I'll drink this. And, mm-hmm. you know, it, again, it's looking for that like magic pill or magic answer of like, I'll just take this one thing yeah, and exactly. I hope I'll be better. Yeah, like a um, lot of people assume pro, uh, yogurt is a probiotic, but no, it may have those live um, bacteria in it, which it mm-hmm. does. But we don't know what strains were used in the making of that probiotic um, and not all or in sorry, in the making of the yogurt mm. and not all strains are a probiotic. Um, so unless it's specifically labeled what was used, which strains were used and is it really a probiotic? We don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, and also it might be not in significant quantities for it to be classed as a probiotic. So, yeah. Yeah, it's when you when you look at buying probiotics and supplementing them to your diet, you've got to take the recommended amount based on the studies used by that brand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right, really important. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so there are obviously different um, strains out there. Which yeah. would be the one that you would say if somebody wants to start looking at supplementation, what should they be looking for? Well, there are billions of strains. So right. yeah, we you would basically find a brand and then you can check what strains are in there and then do research for yourself as to what this is benefit f- beneficial for. Because some strains will be good for preventing constipation and bloating, and some strains will be good for your vaginal microbiome. And it really differs as wow. to what you need. It's yeah. quite a lot of homework then. Yeah. So yeah. if you were somebody who's like, oh my gosh, this all just sounds really complicated. I just want to have something that I can action mm-hmm. quite simple where would they start? Well, I could give you like a typ- typical yeah. rundown of like what our clients what okay. would be like. So we've got Amanda, she's 50 pounds overweight, 25 kilos. She eats a generally beige diet. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's on the go quite a lot. She's, you know, like getting stuff on the go, whether that's at work or whatever else. Like that's a typical diet. And she's like, hmm, I get like stabbing pains in my stomach every now and then. And it's maybe because of this or this, but I'm not too sure. Mm-hmm. Like what would be like some great couple of like just basic action steps that she could maybe just take to see some, you know, yeah benefits to begin with well i mean if she's eating a kind of gray type of diet beige Mm. type of diet and um it's not she's probably not including much diversity in her diet at all so we'd need to start by slowly increasing that diversity and getting more polyphenols from plants so you need to start out by telling her 30 different plants per week like that is your your goal and you don't have to do it immediately but like slowly Mm -hmm. Mm. um Start looking at the fiber intake. Um, so reading nutrition labels. For instance, if you buy bread at the shops, um, bread is the or oh, fiber is the one thing that you're going to look per hundred grams when reading nutrition labels. Everything else you read per serving. Mm-hmm. But with fiber, for something to be considered high fiber, it's got more than six grams of fiber per hundred grams. Okay, that's good. So to know. if if like a lot of people think, oh bread is the devil, I hate bread, whatever. It's really not. It's an excellent source of fiber as long as it's got more than six grams per hundred grams. Because if you get like a brown whole grain loaf, you Mm. can actually get quite a lot of fiber in in some of the bread. Yeah, Yeah. but a lot of the breads that are brown whole grains don't have the six grams that we need. Oh, really? Yeah, so some of them will be like 5.1 or whatever, but then you get other brands that are like 6.8 and there's no calorie really difference and it's just like, why not? That's a simple swap that you can do. That's something I found actually because I buy seeded bread um, and particularly I buy it for the protein content because my Mm. son can't have dairy, so I think anywhere I can get some protein into him. Um, And the difference between two different brands of seeded bread per slice is like two grams of protein. Yeah. So like I buy one brand and it's seven grams of protein per slice. How, how cool That's is amazing. that? Twice, I want well. that bread. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it comes in, I can't remember the name, it comes in like a white, crunchy, papery packet. Yeah. Um, it's very expensive. Yeah. But yeah, so it is really Dane, di- interesting, like yeah. the difference that just looking at the labels can make. And you think, well, I'm still buying seeded bread, but even between brands. Yeah. You, you would actually find that like most people could probably just look at their general shops, like what they have, mm-hmm. and whether it's bread or this, and you could actually just make some very simple swaps yeah and just by looking just at the, you know, the, the the labels and actually start to get like more fiber more you know new overall nutrients uh minerals protein yeah and yeah, it's sometimes absolutely. it's like it's really like minimalistic to it's make like these changes. little changes and yeah. people think oh i'm gonna have to start with this medication and that many and i mean like i was speaking about probiotics you don't need pro you don't have to supplement with probiotics because if you're eating i mean it's nice to have but if you're eating a diverse diet probiotics are the bacteria that you have already in your gut but if you're eating a diverse diet you're going to help them thrive mm-hmm. you know by themselves mm-hmm. so that that's a benefit like eating a lot of prebiotics will help 
those probiotics thrive. This is the prebiotics are the nourishment. So like we spoke about the resistant starches, um, different veggies are very high in prebiotics, like onion, garlic, leeks, all of that, very high in prebiotics, which are going to help the live bacteria in your gut thrive. So yeah. And then also what this client could look at is seeing... I know it's like a huge controversial topic at the moment, but looking at how many artificial sweeteners she's actually getting in her diet, because they've, they've, I mean, the research is still fairly new with artificial sweeteners, but a lot of the studies that have been done show that it can influence the gut microbiome mm -hmm. and glucose metabolism and cause, um, lead to weight, uh, weight gain and things like that. So that could be something that they might need to check. Yeah. There's, there's also probably a correlation of someone's eating a lot more artificial sugars. They're probably eating a lot more processed foods, which means yeah. there's less space in their diet for all these other high fiber vegetables. Yeah. Yes, exactly. You know. So what when you're filling up on that, you're removing something. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying don't have artificial sweeteners. They're in most things yeah. nowadays, most dietary foods and all of that. But then still make sure that you're including a lot of plant-based foods in your yeah. diet. Like if you really want this like snack or this chocolate that has a, an artificial sweetener in, put, have it, um, you know, as part of a balanced snack platter, like have, add some strawberries to that for the fiber and some hummus with like vegetable sticks or whatever. And you'll be satisfied on just having a piece of the chocolate and not the whole thing, mm -hmm. but you've got the fiber from the fruits and things to keep you full. And that will help your yeah. gut thrive. With, with the, I'm uh, that. You definitely ha do see that in some people who have a lot of artificial sweeteners mm -hmm. and they often just don't realize like how much they're having. So yeah. some people are like, oh yeah, like I'm, I'm not having that much. I only have like a kind of Diet Coke a day. I mean, it's like, well, actually like your protein shake has got artificial sweeteners in it and then you had mm -hmm. like a can of Monster and yeah. then you had artificial sweeteners in your three cups of coffee and you had a Diet Coke and it's like, that's actually quite, that's actually quite a lot of mm -hmm. artificial sweeteners yeah. in the day yeah. versus maybe just having stuff that's maybe slightly more natural. And it's like if you actually look at that, it, it is quite a lot at that point. You know, like yeah. I'm like I love having like a Coke Zero and, and every now oh, and then. Me too. Yeah. yeah, you know, but it's it's in moderation. Mm. You know what With I mean? Everything. Yeah, like yeah. so sometimes I'll like buy like a couple of crates for the fridge, <laughs> uh, the caffeine free ones, which are meant to be even more processed, uh, and mm. the you know the, the Coke Zero. But then sometimes I'll find like oh, I've started having one a day. I mean, I just so I just won't buy them for like a month or two and just not mm -hmm. have them in the fridge just to like yeah. almost like balance that back out. Like, oh, I've started becoming a, like a little bit more of a habit. And, yeah. and also like, yeah, again, it's you, the my, it's, it, I think it's the same thing with a lot of things with your health. It's like what you do the majority of the time matters, not the minority. Absolutely. And if that artificial sweetener is starting to become something that you're having like, multiple times throughout the day it can you could imagine could start to co cause some issues yeah and it's i mean it's not just gut health when it comes to artificial sweeteners a uh, sort of a big problem with them is that um like and this is not for all artificial sweeteners but like aspartame contains something called uh, phenylalanine and that actually competes with tryptophan um at the blood brain barrier for like receptor site and why that's an issue is that is because tryptophan is a precursor for serotonin production. So we need tryptophan to make serotonin, which is our happy hormone. And if too much of this phenylalanine in the aspartame is competing with it at the receptor site in the brain or at the, the blood-brain barrier, um, less it could interfere with serotonin production and lead to poor mental health and things like that. Well, yeah. yeah, but I mean, having said that, this phenylalanine is also in food, like chicken and all of that, but it's just in a much more concentrated form in the aspartame. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Sorry to interrupt. If you are enjoying this podcast, we would ask you to go and hit the subscribe or the follow button as we are on a mission to grow this podcast to be as big as it can be and get some amazing guests on here to give you guys even more value. It's really interesting how you mentioned earlier as well, the connection between gut health and mental health. Yeah. And I think that's one of the areas of research that I'm really fascinated in at the moment. It seems to be a relatively new area yeah. where there's now proven connections. Would you mind sharing some of the things that are kind of coming out in your industry about that? Yeah, I think not enough people know that how much food can influence our mental health and how getting your gut microbiome happy will improve your mental health. Um, so because, you know, it, it's just such a major thing. Um, having a happy gut will improve your mood because mo a lot of your serotonin, which is your happy hormone, is found in the gut. Um, also, certain nutritional deficiencies can lead to feeling down and depressed and anxious. Like if you've got a vitamin D deficiency, that's major. Um, 
I know in winter in the Super UK, they, common they, in they this supplement. Country, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they supplement it. And yeah. you really notice that it, like people feel more down in winter. And that mm-hmm. could be, yeah. I know it's the weather, but it's also largely <laughs> due to the vitamin D deficiencies that yeah. we're seeing. Um, and then things like omega-3 fatty acids, mm-hmm. very much linked to improved mental health, which um, a lot of people don't get enough of in their diet. That's mm-hmm. sources of that is like fatty fish, salmon, yeah. um, mackerel, tuna, all of that. Great, great sources I, of I supplement omega-3s. with um, omegas yeah. like mm-hmm. year round and vitamin D, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, and like when I get my blood done, again, like in a, in a healthy place, that correlates that as well. Because I think I take like 4,000 I use a day, yeah. which... Steph, uh, it, being a pharmacist, is like, that's like way too much, way too much. But then when I get my blood done, it's like, oh no, I'm like still in like the optimal range. Yeah. But again, it, it can be like person dependent. And that was even when I was like spending more time outside, I still didn't mm-hmm. really tip too much over that. Um, yeah. Because you, you, I just don't think you get as much, like even if you've just been out in the sun for like 20, 30 minutes and you know, in the middle of the day, you it's don't. It's also how much clothes you've got on. Of course, yeah. yeah. You've so, just got your face showing. Yeah, I had a really interesting app. Um, when I lived abroad, it was super, super hot. It was like near the equator. And so I was like not going out in the middle of the day, probably worse than in the UK because I didn't want to get like sun damage or whatever. Um, and then you were covered up. And so I've got this really cool app where you could put in what your clothing was, what was the cloud cover like, what time of day it was, what your location was. It's very geeky. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it would then say, oh, well, you've actually probably only got like this much sun exposure that oh. is what you require for vitamin D. And I actually got less sun exposure in, on the equator <laughs> than I do in the UK because I'm so like happy to go out in clothes like this yeah. in the UK and not for fear of skin cancer. Um, and there I would cover up more. So I think wow. it, like the perception sometimes of, oh, I'm getting outdoor time. It's yeah. not always enough. Yeah, mm. you might need to supplement that with right supplementation or through your diet. So yeah. yeah. You're completely right though. Like if you eat a, va- a, ver- a very diet and you get lots of different color, lots of different variety and you're eating healthy all the time, like you do feel good like your mood is elevated you do have higher energy better cognition um Mm -hmm. and when you're having like regular stools and not feeling bloated all the time like that has an impact on like how you feel in the morning how you feel throughout the day how you feel at work Mm -hmm. so it has a a huge impact on um on your physical health but also like your mental health as Mm -hmm. well yeah no definitely i mean diversity is just i think if there's one like key message from Mm. from this episode it would be include diversity in your diet that's yeah. really really mm-hmm. important yeah what one of the um and i know this is like a, it's, a, it's a very real thing that happens I actually you know like three people who are going through um like bowel cancer at this moment oh, in time, yeah. which is like a bit is, is very sad and you know yeah. they happen to go into like bags and you know, stomas i think is the, the actual word for it but like a huge part of that can be caused just by like a, a complete lack of dietary fiber in the diets right I'm sure that, yeah, look, I don't deal too much with with those kind of patients at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not hospital based right now, Um, but I'm sure, I mean, your diet, because it influences your health, Mm -hmm. everything you put into your body, you know, and influences your health. So that's definitely could be a huge contributing factor. And what's great is that every single day we wake up and we have like, again, a start to like influence what we're putting in. gut microbiome and this will never change or whatever if you're like really honest with yourself and look at what you're eating and it's a lot of like fried foods no color same thing every day um you know a lot of processed things you you're definitely not supporting your gut the way it needs to be supported Mm -hmm. um and changing that will improve every aspect of your life yeah you know your mental health your your gut health your immune response Mm-hmm. everything is there um i don't know i'm yeah correct me if i'm wrong here you said you had food poisoning oh yeah i did and yeah. then that is what caused you to then ha- basically struggle with dairy like yeah so i had like really severe food poisoning mm-hmm. um probably in like 2015 yeah. um and before that i was like one of these people i like lived in India for two months, never had an issue. Like I could eat anything. After that, I was so sensitive. I like developed IBS, like did the FODMAP elimination and reintroduction. And there's still stuff that I can't handle now. Um, But is that something like a trauma to your gut would trigger something like that? So yeah, definitely. I mean, they say that food poisoning is like the number one worst thing that can ever happen to your gut. It's, yeah, it's, it's worse than like, 
years of antibiotic treatment and it's it's really that's what i wanted to ask on about as well like um, yeah. about antibiotics because that's like sometimes people just like i've heard of some people like oh, i've been taking antibiotics for a year and i'm like that is wild that is not <laughs> good for you why are you just <laughs> ever, like especially not for your gut as well it's, no, it's, absolutely. So yeah. antibiotics obviously kill bacteria, but they don't know which bacteria is good and bad. So they mm. just kill it all. And the same thing with, with food poisoning. You like you rid your body of all that good bacteria. So I would have, I don't know if you started a probiotic after that. Yeah. So I then went on a journey of yeah. like, this is why I now do the job I do because mm. I oh, learned wow. so much about nutrition and yet yeah, went down the route of probiotics and figuring out all the different photobaps that I yeah. could and couldn't digest very well um, and improving my diet in general. Mm. Um, and I do think I had like a form of leaky gut at one point yeah. because it was just so many symptoms that were horrible. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm fine now. I know the things that I should probably avoid. Like last night we went out for dinner mm. and I had yummy, delicious, garlicky, creamy goodness and I paid for it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I knew that that would happen. So yeah. it's an informed choice, so it's okay. Yeah. Um, but when you're in the midst of it and it's just happening to you, it's just so miserable. Yeah. And no, you don't know why. And you just feel like I'm eating healthy. Why am I blowing up? Why? What's going on? It's like, yeah, nothing works. It's it's really tough. And the gut health is like a journey. You know, you start taking probiotics. It's not like tomorrow it's fixed. You know, you've got to build it up slowly. And with the, like you said, you couldn't eat dairy um, maybe there was an issue with the enzyme lactase and you mm -hmm. couldn't break down lactose. And certain probiotics actually can lead to the production of those enzymes, mm -hmm. which in the future, you know, will get the lactase to be able to break down the lactose. And is that something, you know, you've said about like wanting the good bacteria to thrive and giving them the right things to feed them up. Yeah. Um, can you kind of like train your gut to be more receptive to the, the things that perhaps had caused an IBS episode in the past? Well, I mean, if you're eating a lot of pre and probiotics, then you're kind of allowing it to thrive. And I'm not sure if it become it, it probably like, you know, you produce enzymes and you you helped like, for instance, with butyrate that that short chain fatty acids that, that's produced that actually helps strengthen the junction or the gut barrier. So it prevents leaky gut and permeability. So doing these little things, you could sort of train your brains. Ugh not train your brain, train your gut. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The second brain of the body, they say. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you could train it to just be better. Yeah. So what I find really interesting, because my background's in yoga and we do a lot yeah. of work around the vagus nerve and how like, your breathing can affect Sorry, it. What, how... what is the vagus? Like... The vagus nerve is a... Vagus. Like... Vagus, V-A-G-U-S. Not, not like, like vagus, like... like we're going to Vegas. No, no. no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the party okay. nerve. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> No, so yeah. it's um, a, a really significant nerve, like down the back of your body, or like kind of in the middle of your body, but it's very linked to your fight and flight response. Okay. And so when you're doing um, like yoga breathing, or if you go into an inversion in yoga, mm -hmm. it calms your vagus nerve down, which calms your fight and flight response. Is that because you do response. like a lot of belly breathing almost? Yeah, so okay. belly breathing, um, having your legs above your head, just because it sends like a whole blood rush towards your heart so your mm. heart goes whoa we better like lower blood yeah. pressure lower heart rate because we don't want your head mm. to explode um so you can like biohack in a way yeah. um but it goes from your brain to your gut right and so it's so key in terms of like stress anxiety mood disorders yeah that is something you can control with breathing and because mm -hmm. I've, I've found that if i've done belly breathing before i feel like zen yeah. afterwards yeah. like really really like chill yeah um which is not a normal state for me to be in so. <laughs> <laughs> it just shows how linked they are like they yes just, so yeah and so um where i was going with it is obviously it links into your gut and so if there are things that you eat that don't sit well like i mm. find if i eat garlic my heart rate goes up like okay. i i start to feel anxious and oh, i know wow. maybe i'm like hypersensitive to it but uh, it makes complete sense to me mm -hmm. knowing like there's this connection there um and i don't know what the like latest research is in terms of like the impact on anxiety and mood disorders with that gut brain axis but it's an area that i think is really fascinating when we talk about holistic health and the things that you're doing to improve your gut health have all these knock-on impacts yeah no absolutely i mean there's there's a lot of research out there i just think they are so linked so it it absolutely makes sense that you know, you would feel something in your mind when you eat garlic um, because there's that direct pathway. 
Yeah. yeah. And the other way that I've heard it explained, which also a lot of people can connect to, is, you know, when you're anxious, you feel butterflies in your stomach. Like, that's yeah. what we describe it as. Yeah. It's a reason yeah. for that. Be- yeah, because yeah. it's a thing. <laughs> yeah. Because they're connected. Um, and it's also, when you think about, like, evolution, well, when there's a danger or there's a, something that you're watching out for, we need to take our attention away from or our energy away from digesting food. We actually mm-hmm. now need to go and do stuff. So it makes complete sense that there's a connection there. Yeah. Like, well, stop doing this This is thing. like a bit of a left swing, but like I've had like a lot of people, mm, I don't know if it's ever, but people got like a nervous poo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's like a real thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah like so there's got to be something there like you feel like super anxious or nervous. And mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, just got to run the toilet that quick. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Who knows? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, sa- it sounds like a real thing, Makes doesn't sense. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah it no, absolutely. Mm. Um, so one of the other things that I know you're really passionate about is like where people are getting their information because yeah. there is so much BS out there, whether it's on social media, whether it's on food packaging, we're just bombarded all the time with these messages of like, oh, you need to be doing this for your gut health or you need to be doing this for your health or you mm. need to be doing this or you should eat this, it's healthy. Um, so what would be like the key things that you would ask people to keep in mind when they're viewing these messages, whether that's in the supermarket, whether it's in social media, mm-hmm. if you had your dietitian like hat on, yeah. what would you say? Well, it's, it's difficult because I think nowadays it's it's changed from a couple of years ago, or many years ago. Um, we just have so much access to like so much information. You never know what you like mm-hmm. should believe. So you know, if you're getting your information from influencers online, then check, you know, what credentials they do they have? Are they, you know, just promoting brands? Because there could be a lot of perverse incentives of you hear this is so great for you. And then the next story you see that, oh, buy this product. And you're like, mm-hmm. okay. But if it's a really, you know, if, if it, that influencer maybe has the credentials and like, you know, there's science backing the product and the research, then I would say you know, it, it could be seen as a benefit to have all this information, but it's really you need to check it where you're getting your information from. Is that person qualified? Is she a dietitian, a nutritionist, you know, whatever, um, has some form of education with regards to it? Or is it just, you know, purely to make money on, on the side? Um, I think so it's yeah. important to highlight as well that dietitian is a protected title, yeah. but nutritionist isn't if I'm correct. Yeah, I know, I know with dietetics, it's more medical kind of issues and nutrition. I'm not 100% sure what the exact difference is. But yeah, I mean, you can't like into a diet, a nutritionist won't be able to apply for jobs as a dietitian. I mean, they don't have that medical background that I mean, when we were in my third year, we most of the time working in hospitals and mm-hmm. fourth year, you also third and fourth year, you're mainly in the hospitals, which I don't think nutritionists do, but they have a lot of knowledge in other things, maybe more holistic kind mm-hmm. of, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. More on the exactly. applied side of nutrition as opposed yeah. to the science and medicine of it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And when it comes to shopping in the supermarket, we've talked already about checking the labels, but mm-hmm. there's so many things out there. They've got like high protein on yeah. them or like good for gut health on <sighs> them. Um, marketing. <laughs> yeah. I can see your face. <laughs> <laughs> I hate misleading marketing. Like the things my patients come in telling me, mm. it's just, it's crazy. Um, they read the front of the label, which or the front of the packaging, where you should be focusing on the back. So the front will say things like low fat, and it probably is low fat. But where they've taken the fat out, they've taken the flavor out because fat adds flavor. And then what do they do to you know, compensate for this. They just pump up the sugar and it's like, well, this tastes great and it's low fat. And, you know, then you look and it's a yogurt with like 25 grams of sugar and Mm. low fat though. So it's healthy. (laughs) But then the the high fat would probably be much better because it's more satiating. Exactly. um, And just not as processed. And and fat isn't bad. We need fat for our hormones, for our metabolism, all of that. So... It also depends on what fat, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it will, like a lot of things like cereals for me are the worst because you start your morning off. It's really important to start your morning off with high protein, high fiber, just to set the tone up for your blood sugar for the whole day. And having a cereal that's low in, I know there are brand, brands out there Sorry, that are probably Sorry, could you better. just explain, explain mm-hmm. that a little bit more? Like just, yeah. just so people have got more of an understanding. Um, so like you want to have like a high protein, high fiber diet because it's not going to spike your blood sugar, but that. Yeah would lead to a blood sugar crash, which is what drives people to go and feel hungry again and eat more food. Yeah, exactly. If, if you start your day off with protein and fiber, those are the two things that are going to help balance your blood sugar and help maintain that throughout the day. Whereas if you start your meal off with a high sugar 
cereal, for instance, mm. and I'm not saying all sugars are high in cereal, read the back of the label mm-hmm. once again. Um, but if you if you start your day out with a high sugary cereal, you're going to cause a spike in your blood sugar because there's no fiber. Fiber, our body has to break that down. So instead of getting this huge spike, it, the shift in your blood sugar is more like that. Um, but with starting your day out with a sugar, mm. a high sugar cereal, you spike it and then it drops. And immediately when it drops, we feel that crash of luck. I'm going to faint. You know, if you stand up too quickly, you get a bit dizzy. It's just that like terrible feeling. And we immediately think, I, I just need to pick up my energy and you grab for like the muffin or the chocolate or whatever just to spy. And then it's a never ending cycle of your blood sugar doing this. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you started your day out with high fiber, high protein, it would just, you know, stabilizing your blood sugar keeps you fuller for longer. Um, what are some yeah. like, have you got any like breakfast recommendations that people could typically have that are high protein, high fiber? Well, I would think you should, when you wake, you should plan your breakfast based on like where's your carbohydrate coming from? where's your protein coming from and where's your fat. So your carbohydrate should always be a high fiber carb. And you can interchange, you don't have to eat, like I said, diversity, eat different Mm. things. So one morning you could do like an overnight oats because then you've got the fiber from the oats, add protein to that to help keep you fuller for longer. And then- So that would be like a Greek yogurt or something? Or a protein powder, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Protein powder. Um, Chia seeds are really excellent because they're high in protein and fiber. Um, And then some berries or whatever then you've got that on one day. And you can do that, you can maybe make that like four, three times a week. And then on days where you don't have to meal prep, and that's a nice thing that you can like take to work. But maybe if you're working from home, um, a slice of toast that obviously has the more than six grams of fiber per hundred grams with an egg. And then you can think, okay, where's your fat coming from? Either you're cooking the egg in olive oil or you can add some avo, you can have both. I mean, it all depends, you know, how much you want in your diet. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I would say those are two excellent breakfast that you could kind of interchange and with the oats what's nice about oats is they so divert like you can do so much with oats i mm-hmm. love oats um you can make overnight oats you can make chia puddings you can do baked oats yeah it's actually i, just, love, I love the passion yeah, on your the face the passion yes, for the oats. oats is just so especially because there's a wild. there's a real we shared recently about this um, influencer who's like, you must never eat oats. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is basically saying that it spikes your blood sugar and oats spikes your blood sugar. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> eye roll. <laughs> yeah. Wow. yeah, and and we just went on to say like even if you like if you mix it with something like berries, mm-hmm. like it's it's not. But just again like demonizing foods like oats, and we also yeah. see this with um. I actually brought him up on a, another podcast like Carnivore MD Paul Saladina. He's like plants are bad you shouldn't eat plants like meat and fruit only yeah and just like completely trying to like demonize things like oats and like plants and just like really going at the whole like meat and fruit only meat and fruit only and, and like honey and it's okay. um you know he's he's got a big following like his engagement on his pages mm. is huge and it's all for the you know the meat and fruit side of things wow. and just completely goes against you know and i think this is where people do just get so confused exactly um, i mean that's why you have to really check who like that influencer that was bashing the oats go onto her page and look what, what like, it's difficult because how would you, she could be lying about what she has. Mm -hmm. But I suppose, yeah, you kind of have to do your own research as well. If you hear something, maybe don't believe it from the get-go unless that person has the the credentials or unless, you know, rather just do your own research behind what you hear as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Going back to the the cereal spiking the blood sugar thing, just something I remembered as well and why we need to read the back of the nutrition label is because often with these things that are low in fiber and all of that, you look at the back and the serving size is Mm -hmm. like 30 grams, Mm -hmm. which is about two and a half tablespoons. I don't know one person that gets full on that or that eats that. Yeah. And also, if you go and you get a breakfast bowl out and you pour a bowl of cereal, the amount of people who've done that, and like yeah. clients, I've asked them to go and just pour your normal bowl and then like weigh it out. And they're like, oh my gosh, it's two and a half servings. Exactly. Of, like and, granola. Yeah. yeah. And then you look at the, the back of the label and it's like, oh, three grams of sugar. That's the, per serving. That's fine. That's not mm. a lot. But then you're like, okay, three grams of sugar per two tablespoons of cereal, you know, then it's adding up mm-hmm. because you're not you're not having two tablespoons, you're having like maybe eight tablespoons mm-hmm. and that's yeah. three times eight. It's just, yeah. We, I don't know if I've even shared this before, but um, Steph, my girlfriend, used to be my client. <laughs> when I was the first <laughs> Nothing doing weird. Pers- <laughs> when, I first doing pe- when I first started doing personal training, she actually won a competition and, and come in and wanted to, to lose weight. I think she needed to lose about yeah. uh, 30 pounds. And uh, I just got a track of foods, you know, just for like the first like couple of days. And then I was looking at it and I was like, are you eating 1100 calories in granola? And she was just like, no. Yeah. <laughs> and I was just like, 
what like oh like and it was basically she was just having like a really big bowl of granola mm. and just wasn't wasn't realizing like how mm. much she was pouring into the bowl and how dense granola is with the full fat milk on top of it and it's so sugary and so much sugar in it as well she was like yeah but it tastes really nice and i'm like and it's also marketed as being healthy it yes. is marketed as so being healthy that's but why she put oats thought, in it Nicole. i mean yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was like if you just remove that one meal from your diet you'd yeah. start like rapidly losing weight yeah yeah um, and we just we did we actually swapped it out for just some overnight oats with some blueberries raspberries and some flaxseed mm-hmm. uh, and she just started having that i was like a pretty big portion still for about 400 calories instead of the 11 yeah. and like that single i was like you could change nothing else and you would start to lose weight now yeah um which was exactly. just crazy because in her mind it's like oh i've started going to the gym i'm with a personal trainer i'm gonna eat granola um <laughs> and instead was actually eating like 1100 calories Twelve. of granola which is it is isn't it because it's that perception of like oh i'm eating healthy people say granola is healthy but then not managing the portion or realizing that like yeah it says you know 200 calories per 30 grams on the front but yeah. then you don't realize that. Well, like, that's like a sprinkle on top of a bowl of yogurt. That's not like a bowl of granola. Yeah. yeah. But serving. I think that they are misleading on the front of the Very packet as misleading. well sometimes because they'll say like, oh, two servings is this. And it's like, if you put two servings in a bowl sometimes, you're like, that's like rabbit food. You know yeah, I mean? exactly. <laughs> and I mean, granola, like if you really want your granola, you're like, I, I need this in my life. Maybe like add things to it so have mm. make your bowl of oats with your um, and then put a little bit on that the top. could be like a yeah. topping mm-hmm. because that's, that's what probably do. what it's for mm-hmm. having it as a topping because two tablespoons is probably a topping not your whole meal <laughs> and then also adding fiber and protein will help lower the the glucose spike mm-hmm. um which is really helpful as well yeah like eating sorry eating um fat and protein with your carbs they call it like clothe your carbs helps mm. reduce the insulin oh i like spike. that clothe your carbs Clo- add clothes to your carbs <laughs> so like never just have like a bowl of oats by itself have a protein with that and you'll get less of a glucose spike mm-hmm. yeah yeah when it comes to breakfast foods um one of the things that was a massive game changer for me was this label breakfast foods because we we're all like right what would we have for breakfast okay well obviously cereal mm-hmm. eggs toast um but actually living in asia they just have food for breakfast. Yeah. They, have, they can have sushi. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah. Or like yeah. dim sum or curry. And when you make that shift in your head of there's not breakfast foods, it's so much easier to eat a balanced plate because yeah. it's like another proper meal. Um, and I know it sounds a bit weird, but genuinely do like this. I love having fish and broccoli for my breakfast. <laughs> um, but when you take <laughs> okay. away like the Western breakfast food yeah. concept, mm. that's not weird. Um, and it's really balanced and it's delicious and it keeps me full. Yeah. Um, so I think actually that's something that we as a Western society have made like well, difficult. We've normalized it, yeah. Yeah, we've mm. made it yeah. like you've got to fit it into this box of like these three types of food that you may eat before 10 a.m. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then people feel really like, how am I possibly going to get the fat, carbs and protein in from those choices? Yeah, no, exactly. And I mean, having a savory breakfast is also really good if you're really looking to hone down on balancing your blood sugar levels. They say that savory breakfasts are you know the way to go mm-hmm. so and i mean it's not that far-fetched have far-fetched having <laughs> fish for breakfast because like people have like salmon with eggs right. and toast and that's mm-hmm. normal so. yeah i also you you. another one for people to try um dippy eggs which other people call boiled eggs i learned that i'm weird i call them dippy eggs what do you mean dippy eggs see um, no i mean like I, I used to get that when i was like a kid when you get the little uh, egg holders yeah and then you, and like, you dip you, bread you, in it yeah, dip, yeah yeah i felt like that Dip, dip, tender stem broccoli, like grill the tender stem broccoli so that it goes a little bit crispy and then dip the fluffy bit in the egg. Oh, <laughs> so, so good. I just remember, I mean, dipping, to- dipping toast in the egg. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's as far you as I remember. You can have toast on your plate as well, but yeah. you've got to try off. I just yeah. don't think I've got any of those ed- egg cup holders anymore. No, Nate yeah. broke mine. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Devastating. <laughs> no more dippy yeah. eggs. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to making smart choices then, your biggest tip is like, look at the back, not at the front, which yeah. is a really great, easy thing for people to remember when they're in the shops. It's so simple. Yeah. And then watch out for things like serving sizes, how much sugar is in the serving size, 
with the fiber, you're going to look per 100 grams just because that's like the rule of thumb, you know, to keep it general because things have mm -hmm. varying amounts. Um, but yeah, back of labels is key. The other thing that I found really helpful um, is online shopping. Yeah. Because when you're in the supermarket and it, it's got like all of this whole aisle in front of you and you don't want to stand there and look like a weirdo, like getting everything off the shelf, looking and putting it back. Maybe it's just me that gets self-conscious <laughs> about that. That's like me in every supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But when you're at home, I can like geek out and like, open all the tabs of all the different things yeah. and compare. Really sit there and compare. Yeah. And yeah. especially if you think, you know what, I just want to level up my breakfast and just spend like 15 minutes just looking at breakfast choices and do your homework. Mm -hmm. You can really feel empowered then. If you do want to do an online shop, cool, add it to your basket. But if you do want to go to the shops, you already know like what you should be looking at. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I don't know how true this is, but I think shops like display their shelves based on mm. what they get mo maybe mo more profit from. Oh, yeah. Like yeah, yeah. Like things on the bottom, they're yeah. not really making much, but you're missing that because you're probably not like scanning. I mean, no one has time. Like you could, like you said, you can sit in your bed and like figure out recipes and go online shopping and things like that. Whereas in the shops, it's like, oh my gosh, when is the next train? Let me hurry this up. Just grab, you know, mm -hmm. so... Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, you see idea. that like in, uh, in Tesco, it's like you literally walk and at the front facing part of at the end of every aisle, alcohol. Alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. alcohol, like literally so it, it is like that, but I do like what you just said there, Stace, because that could be like a one-time investment where you go, right, I'm going to spend 20 minutes mm -hmm. and I'm going to go look at the back of the packets of all these foods and just level up just my breakfast, that one meal. And like that one 20, 30 minute investment could literally make you now mm -hmm. have one or two different or three different because variety is important. Yeah, <laughs> different yeah. breakfast options that are now going to save you so much more, hopefully for like years to come. Yeah, no, yeah. And I feel like a lot of patients like, I mean, we obviously know these things because we're in the nutrition space, but a lot of people, they don't know what all is out there. Like they just think for dinner, I'm going to have rice every evening. And then I'm like, okay, what about bulgur wheat or quinoa? Or And they're like, some of them are just like, what is that? They like, sound so exotic. Mm. <laughs> and I'm like, it's literally yes. next to the rice. You know what's, yeah. what's been one of the, the best things for my variety? Like it's made me absolutely like really, really enjoy it. We started using the HelloFresh. Um, oh, yeah. Prior to that, we probably did just cycle the maybe five to ten different meals that we'd have of an evening uh, and like sometimes like i remember we just we made turkey mince once and ate it for like six days straight and i was like, like just shoot me i just never I never just, again yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but now we get like hella fresh and it's like we basically have like either we, we get it for four but it's only only for two of us so we'll cook it and then we'll have maybe that for like uh, lunch the next day mm. um but like i just feel like i'm eating like completely different food and food i would never eat yeah it uh, like before. forces you to yeah, get out your it, comfort zone I, yeah nice. and it's like not sponsored by hella fresh at all by the way but like no it's i actually, use gusto just for yeah the <laughs> balance, <laughs> for the balance. Um, <laughs> there's so many out there yeah. like it's yeah it's crazy but like you get you get like that this is probably the most diverse that my mm. diet's been and we get our blood done like once a year and we're actually seeing that our uh god what is it your like um the saturated fat. Oh my god! Cholesterol, I don't even, LDL cholesterol. Yeah, it just gone like really high in a good way. And he oh, was the like, HDL cholesterol. Yeah, and he was basically yeah. he was basically just saying like, have you changed much in your diet? I was like, oh, we've started having more variety. Right. Yeah, and amazing. Yeah, so you know who knows? It's very po very possible. But to be honest, just like having a more varied diet has been enjoyable as mm, well as yeah. coming with more benefits. So why your cholesterol may have lowered is because fiber actually binds cholesterol and then we excrete it. So adding fiber, not only for gut health, but it also lowers our cholesterol levels. So it could, could have been that, that you were yeah. doing. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Which is really cool. Well, you've had some um, really great insights today for our listeners, Nicole, and particularly those takeaway tips that you shared of like what to do in the supermarket, what to look for, mm -hmm. variety to introduce. Um, so if anybody wants to find you online, where can they go and search you out? So I, my Instagram handle is Nourish with Nix, and yeah, they can go have a look there. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming down. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, guys. If you enjoyed today's episode, then we know you're going to love episode number 47 with renowned nutrition expert Martin McDonald. So search for episode 47 of the Body Smart podcast on your preferred platform. 